Boy, I tell you, after this weekend, it's, it's kind of like, what in the world could I actually say? <laughs> and uh, those guys are tough acts to follow. <laughs> so anyway, I'll, uh, uh, I, I think this is very relevant. And uh, what I want us to do is uh, go to Matthew 28. And I want to look at the Great Commission. We'll revisit that, perhaps. And there are uh, four things I want to talk about today. Number one is the authority in the church. Number two is the mission of the church. Number three is our identification in the church. And then number four is our devotion to the church. And we'll see those uh, key points in the Great Commission. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to contrast the truth from that which we're seeing by and large today within the church and how different it is from the mission that Jesus gave us. And so with that, let's start in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Well, the first thing we get here is the authority in the church, and actually the authority of the world, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the supreme ruler. He reigns supreme. And everything now and at one day will be subject to him. If you turn over to Colossians 1, there's a beautiful portion of scripture that speaks to that very thing. It says this about Jesus. Colossians 1.15 He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. That word authority that we uh, read when Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, it speaks to the point of somebody having the right to command something, and the might to carry it out. So it speaks of the right and the might. The right is by one's position, Jesus Christ being the ruling, reigning, sovereign God over all things. The might speaks of one's ability. And when we think about that, Jesus said what? I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Right and might. Jesus has the right and the might. Now in the specific context that we're looking at here, He's talking about his church, isn't he? He's talking about going into all the world and making disciples. He's talking about really the work of redemption and the mission of the church. And we know that by virtue of his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus Christ has disarmed all principalities, all powers. He has made a spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Colossians 2.15 tells us that. Other portions of scriptures I just read, uh, uh, Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, he is the preeminent one. So much so that God has said that in these last days, he has spoken fully and finally through Jesus Christ our Lord, Hebrews 1. And so I think it would be well that we listen to the Son, amen? For that pleases the Father in all things. You know what got the nation of Israel in trouble time and time again is what? They went away from the Word of God, didn't they? And they disobeyed the Word of God. And, and I was reading Jeremiah uh, oh, a couple weeks ago, read through that, and I just marked all the times that it said, and they did according to the dictates of their own heart. And unfortunately, brothers and sisters, we see much of the professing church today doing the same thing. And I'm sure that it grieves the heart of Almighty God going according to the dictates of their of their own heart. And unfortunately, this error has crept in the church. Brothers and sisters, uh, we can say we're ignorant. We can say we just didn't know. But in my opinion, it is rebellion to God. It is simply rebellion to God. You know, 1 Timothy 4.16, if you want to go there, speaks 
Paul speaking to a young minister, uh, and from what we can see in those letters, a little bit timid at times, uh, and he is exhorting him. And in 1 Timothy 4, 16, 4, 16, he says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, to the teaching, the apostles' teaching handed to them by Jesus. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Now he wasn't talking about being justified before God, because if you were to back up in chapter 4, what does he say? Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. He's talking about remaining sound in teaching so that you'll deliver yourself from false teachers and false teachings and those that you're teaching. And that should be the shepherd's heart. Amen? That should be the heart of a shepherd. And Paul's exhorting him to that. So that we talk about the authority here. And Jesus is the authority in the church. The next thing we see here in verse 19 is the mission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The mission of the church, and, and I'm going to talk about the method and the message. Those are three M's that might help you uh, remember that. The mission uh, includes the method and the message. So here we see the authority in the church, Jesus setting the mission for the church. He gives us the very method by which we're to make disciples, and I'll bring some other scriptures into that. Even down to the specific message that we're to use, okay? So, we have this mission. Jesus, again, says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Brothers and sisters, did you know there is no backup plan? There's none. And there is no alternative, and there is no permission to change the original. It is what it is, and it works time through times, through cultures, and so forth. This is it. It's not going to change. The only thing we're called to do is what? Believe it and obey it. Believe it and obey. Trust and obey. There is no other way, right? It's a wonderful hymn. And that's what we're called to do. And we're called to make disciples. Now, in, in that day, a disciple was said to be a learner. The Greek thought was uh, a little bit deeper than that. It, 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 it spoke of somebody that, in a sense, attached themselves to the teacher, okay? and adhered to the teacher's teachings and obeyed the teacher's commands, okay? Uh, Mark 8 is a great example of when Jesus uh, is giving us an idea of what discipleship looks like and, and what a true disciple is. Go to Mark 8 with me, and uh, we'll pick that up in, oh, let's see here, Mark 8. Mark 8. 34. Mark 8, 34. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If you said that, just those portions of Scripture in most churches, you'd clear them out. People wouldn't come back. they said, really? There's a cost to this? I mean, salvation is free, amen? But when we're in, through faith, in Jesus Christ and repentance from sin, brothers and sisters, Jesus doesn't say this is an alternative here. He doesn't say, think about it. If you want to do it, do it. No, this is the call to follow him. And again, he's the authority. And so he says we are to lose our life for his sake and his cause. He gave us life. We're to give ours back. So we see here then the mission and Jesus said that it is to go into all the world. You know, this is kind of interesting. I heard a preacher the other day say this, and it just, I mean, I guess I knew it, but it just really kind of dawned on me. Did you know America is not the epicenter of Christianity? It started in Jerusalem. But often we think what? When we hear the thing, go into all the world, we think, well, it's, it's Nepal, and, and it certainly is. And we think of those countries. But did you know that Paul and Peter... America wasn't even on the radar screen. We are the ends of the earth, right? 
And so we can say, whether we go to another country or not, we have been to the ends of the earth and we are making disciples, right? Now, God does call some people overseas full time and all that. You guys know that. But I just think that's kind of interesting. We, in our Western mindset, think we're kind of the epicenter of, of all things and uh, we really are. We're the ends of the earth. And one of the things I want to say is that a healthy New Testament fellowship is one that will take this call very seriously to take the gospel here and abroad, wherever God opens doors. You know, uh, I've never been in the army, um, but can you imagine uh, somebody saying to uh, their sergeant, you know, he gives the orders, and he says, well, sergeant, I don't really feel like I should be involved in that. I, that's not my giftings. Uh, I think I'll go do something else. That man would get a dishonorable discharge, wouldn't he? I, I think he would. And so, guys, we don't have the right to change this and so forth. Unfortunately, much of the church growth methods have done that very same thing. And that's what my contrast is here. You know, Jesus did not say to go market your church using worldly philosophies for Harry and Sally who have a postmodern thinking syndrome. No, they have a syndrome of sin, right? And they just don't want to believe the truth. Okay, so he didn't tell us to change that. Gary Gilley wrote a great book, uh, this little church stayed home. He had a few others that he followed up with. I just want to read a little excerpt from page 12 uh, of his book. This is what he says about the church growth. For two decades, the church growth experts have told us that if we're to attract the unchurched, we must change the way we do church. We must offer them new settings and experiences. We must meet their perceived felt needs. We must do away with biblical exposition and focus on stories. We must eliminate dogma and become relevant. We must do away with hymns and major on contemporary music. We must remove our Christian symbols and traditions and behave more professionally and secularly. We must train our pastors to be CEOs rather than shepherds. When we've done all this, we have been assured we will attract the masses. And that's unfortunately what's being done today in the church. But the question is, did Jesus tell us to do that? Did he tell us to market the church? Absolutely not. He did not tell us to do that. We are to make disciples. And as Roger said, we're not to fill the pews with lost people and just to entertain them so hopefully they'll like our Jesus because they see that we're really cool people. That's not the call of the church. These people, many of them, sitting in these churches are unconverted thinking they're okay because perhaps they said some silly little prayer and they think they're in the club and yet they've never repented of their sin and placed their faith squarely in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And we're going to entertain them all the way to hell. And somebody's going to give an account of that. And I'm going to tell you something. I want to be like Paul. The blood is off my hands. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole gospel, the whole counsel of God's word. It's what a shepherd should be. It's what a preacher should should be. And so God never told us to do it this way. So this obviously has been infiltrated by men and their method and their messages. And then you really, really got a question. Well, what is their motive? What really is their motive? Now within the mess, uh, I'm sorry, within the mission, we have the method and the message. I want to talk about those because I think there's two things that have gone on in Christendom, the, the professing church as a whole. We've redefined who the church is and we've redefined the gospel. And I want to hit on those as we move forward through this. Go to Mark 16, 15, and we'll bring some other scriptures into this idea of the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There we have the method and the message, okay? If you go to Luke, we'll pick up what Luke said at the end uh, through the Holy Spirit, leading him and, and inspiring him to write these words. Luke 24, 44. I'll, I'll start at 46. Then he said to them, Talking about Jesus. Thus it is written. Pick that up. Thus it is written. And thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached 
in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power on high. Brothers and sisters, the first step in making disciples is evangelism. It's the proclamation of a message. The method is the proclamation. Proclamation means to open our mouths openly and honestly before people in a spirit of love and tell them the gospel. Okay, that's what we're called to do. That idea of proclamation, some people say, well, I'm not a preacher, I can't do that. Or I'm not a street preacher, I won't do that. But that's not necessarily what it all means. If God calls you to be a street preacher, then get up and preach, right? That's a great thing and a great joy if you understand the gospel and do it in a spirit of love. But proclaim as this idea of herald. And I don't know if you guys recall the scripture where Jesus pulls his disciples uh, uh, to himself and he says, hey guys, listen, what I tell you in the dark, you proclaim it on the rooftops. Well, at that time, uh, many, and they would have understood this, many of the homes were right next to each other, maybe like a big city, and they would congregate up on the top of these houses, the rooftops. And so what Jesus is saying is herald this thing from the rooftop. That's how they would get word out to people. They'd go up on top of their building and talk to the neighbors on the next building. Before you go, it went around and got all screwed up, definitely. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the message should never get messed up, right? So that gives us this picture of proclaiming and heralding this glorious, glorious gospel. And really, this isn't complicated, is it? I'm not telling you folks anything you've not read or heard before. This is not complicated at all. In fact, Jesus even promised to supply us with the necessary power that we would go and proclaim the gospel. Acts 1.8, right? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's, you, 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 you want to know what a spirit-filled person is. It's a person that boldly proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. Read the, books of, read the book of Acts, brothers and sisters, and see if what I'm saying is true. See if that was a principle throughout the book of Acts. Did they take the gospel and proclaim it? Yes, they did. Unfortunately, today, 2% of all professing Christians openly share their faith. 2%. 2%. Many people say, I don't have the gift. I don't think I have a gift necessarily. Now, there is an office of evangelists, I believe, operates today. Um, and they are a gift to the body of Christ. Amen? They're to equip us and so forth. But all of us are called to enact this. I think of Acts 8.1. So persecution breaks out, right? And all these people that were getting comfortable in Jerusalem, God uses to spread them out. And what do they do? Now, think about this. These people may have lost homes, families, um, businesses, whatever. Some of them probably stayed and, and, and just took up residence there. But now they're on the run. And guess what we find them doing in Acts 8? Preaching and teaching Jesus Christ to everybody they came into contact with. Now, if you and I were on the run, would that be the first thought? Maybe it would maybe say, gosh, I've lost everything else. I might as well tell people about Jesus. You know, I don't know. But think about that. We are called to do that. That's a great example. And then secondly, um, this might give me a little bit of trouble. It has before. I don't, I don't agree with relationship evangelism. I don't see it in the book of Acts. I don't agree with friendship evangelism, as many have defined it. I mean, what it becomes is, you know, leaf raking for Jesus, car washing for Jesus, everything for Jesus, just showing people the love of Jesus. And I'm not saying we should not do kind acts for people. Please don't misunderstand what I say. But most times there's no gospel. We're just going to let our actions speak for ourselves. That's not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what? I believe in friendship evangelism. I know you heard me say I didn't, but... I believe we should be friendly to people and tell them about Jesus as we're friendly to them. Friendship evangelism. Does that make sense? I think that's what we're called to do. And they did it. Paul did not go into a town, set up shop, build relationships for years before he ever got to the point of telling about Jesus Christ. Because ultimately you come to this thought, when is the right time that I've built enough of a relationship to tell them about Jesus? I've talked to complete strangers on the street, had a relationship with them in, in, in a matter of minutes and been able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am not a great conversationalist. I'm not. It's not a great gift of mine. All right. That leads me to this, brothers and sisters. And again, is this the command? 
No, it's not the command. The command is not to just build a relationship and not say anything about Jesus. The command is to proclaim the gospel. God's given you a sphere of influence. He's given me a sphere of influence. We're to be faithful with the message um, and the method. Amen? The method. And that leads me to the message, the gospel. Now, many seeker-sensitive churches will say this, and I heard this from several pastors as I was a young pastor in training. John, we never change the message. We just change the way we communicate the message to make it more relevant. And in essence, they changed the message. They changed the message. Jesus did not say to make the message more relevant. In other words, to be palatable to a postmodern mindset. He didn't say that. That was not Paul's approach in Corinth, was it? Brothers and sisters, it's so good to know the historical setting of those letters. Because in that day, the, 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 the Corinthians and other people that time, they just loved to sit and hear all these philosophies of people. Okay, And one of the philosophies that they loved, or a couple of them, was this. Worldly success and life improvement. So guess what the false teachers gave them? Worldly success in the name of Jesus and life improvement in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what they did. They took off the rough edges of the gospel. They gave them the here and now, appealing to their felt needs and, and being successful. And so they tapped into this untapped niche that was never there before, the Christians. And so what they did is they dressed up the gospel and dumbed it down to meet the carnality of that mindset of the day. And we see that, unfortunately, in the church as a whole today. Paul went in there and did something entirely different. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, knowing that background. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1. And I'll start at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Now, he wasn't downplaying baptism. Just go up a few verses and we'll see that he, he did baptize. But he's talking about a, a matter of priority here, okay? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. Pick that up, with wisdom of words. He's talking about human wisdom. Lest the cross of Christ should be made no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to, the, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. When you think of the, the, uh, some of the outspoken... Um, people today that are supposedly very wise uh, in the ways of the world and how they blaspheme God. I'm sure it is an offense to think uh, if you're a PhD and you've got this degree and that degree that you have to come the same way as some lowly beggar on the street. I'm sure that that just pricks at their conscience. They don't like that, you know. Now go down to chapter 2 and look at what Paul said again. He said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech, or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. In other words, Paul wasn't eloquent by any way, shape, or form. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words, look at that church, of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul didn't change the message, did he? He went in there with a simple message because he knew one thing that the church has forgotten today. If anyone comes to Jesus Christ, ultimately, it is the power of Almighty God, not man's methodologies and silly little systems to bring people to make a decision for Jesus Christ. It is the power of Almighty God. God, and we must return to that and believe in it. When I go out there and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, I know 
that I'm a, a fumbling, bumbling person with my words most times. But I trust in one thing, that God has chosen in His sovereignty to use you and I, these, these vessels of clay, to declare His word and by His power bring people to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I go out trusting and knowing that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You know, did Paul use this method? You know, today we, we seem to have changed the method. Let me just give you an example, um, a few examples. We've changed the message to this. Are you lonely? Come to Jesus. Do you need a, a shot of self-esteem? Come to Jesus. God has a wonderful plan. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. There's truth in that. But brothers and sisters, I want to tell you a story. I was at LifeLight, and I was out witnessing. It's a Christian festival. attracts thousands of people. And my question to many was this. Okay, you got a couple minutes. You've come up upon somebody dying. They're going to die. They're going into eternity. What is your message? These are professing Christians, and most of them went blank. And then I had to kind of prompt them a little bit, and only one person gave the right message, the gospel. One gal, and this is no lie, Tony was there with me, Monica's husband. She said, well, I would tell them God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their... And she stopped herself and said, afterlife. So if that message doesn't work two minutes before somebody's going into eternity, why are we using it when we don't know when they're going into eternity? It's not, brothers and sisters, it's not about having a better life now. I, I would never trade that old life that God saved me from. No way. But I'll tell you what. My life in the eyes of the world has not been a better life now. I've gone through a little bit of persecution and suffering and a lot of chastisement from my loving Heavenly Father. Can you guys attest to that? So in the eyes of the world, and just think of an unconverted person. God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life. That's great because I love myself too. And I've got a great plan for my life and God just wants to add to it. I'll sign up. What do I got to do? And then some silly little evangelist who should spend more time in the Word of God and on his knees in prayers goes and tells people in the church how many decisions he got for Jesus Christ so that he can rake in the money. That is wrong, brothers and sisters. That is so, so wrong. And yet we've given into that. Paul didn't do that. I won't go to 2 Corinthians 5. But brothers and sisters... Just jot that down. The gospel is about being saved from sin because we are born sinners and we are under the wrath of Almighty God. And if we die in sin without being reconciled to God, you know what? We are going to hell for eternity. That's the cold hard facts. That is where sin takes us because God is holy and God is just. And yes, He's loving and He's extremely merciful and He delights in mercy. But I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, we have changed it. Do you see that in 2 Corinthians 5? Paul is saying, it is as if, which it is, God is in us pleading with people to be reconciled to himself. Does that sound like God has a wonderful plan for your life? Is what we should be preaching? No. God is in us pleading to be reconciled to God. God knows more than anything what hell will be like. He knows more than anything what his wrath is. Amen? He does. And then at the very end of that 2 Corinthians, he says, For he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. On that cross, Jesus bore our sin debt. He bore the wrath of Almighty God. He drank the bitter cup. And God, it says in Isaiah 53, was pleased to bruise His Son. We are talking about the seriousness of sin. And yet, God's mercy now, through the death of Christ, being satisfied, propitiated, God raising His Son from the dead, His arms of mercy are open to sinners. To come, come and have everlasting life. Come and be forgiven. Come and be reconciled. That's the glorious message of the cross. And we have so dumbed it down that we've stripped it of its power because we will not talk about sin and we will not talk about judgment and we will not talk about an eternity in the lake of fire because we are ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the church needs to repent. It needs to repent. You know what? I, I learned this. I didn't know it. 
I don't know if you guys know this or not. I do get a little intense sometimes when I preach. I can't help it. God saved me 15 years ago. I was a drunk. I was into all kinds of... I was a wicked, wicked man. And he saved me. He saved me. And so this is real, brothers and sisters. And we cannot... Forgive me. I'm not trying to get emotion for this. But we have so perverted this gospel. This glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. When you sell diamonds... I didn't know this. I've never sold diamonds... Anyway, um, if, if you were just to uh, put the diamonds out on the crystal clear table, you know, um, you could take the nicest, um, um, most radiant, uh, expensive diamond, best cut diamond, put them next to the other ones, and you wouldn't be able to tell much of a difference. But if you put the black velvet on there, the radiance of the light will shine through the diamond. And the real, clear, glorious diamond, the, the, the best cut diamond will just radiate above those other diamonds. It's a, it's a sales technique. Brothers and sisters, if we fail to put the black drop of man's sin and depravity, then we strip the gospel of its saving power and we strip it of the glorious work of Jesus Christ. But it is against that black backdrop of sin and depravity and fallenness that God stepped into this world to rescue us because the Bible said he loved us so much. Is that an awesome message to go proclaim? Yes, and we must do it. That is the gospel message, dear ones, and we must not forget it because we must not forget that as, as Romans says, uh, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it is the power of God. The power of God onto salvation. Brothers and sisters, I honestly believe none of us in the church would probably say, oh, there's a little spark of divinity in all of us. And I think we're teeter-tottering with some of the teachings that say that there's been kind of this pre-stuff that now man has the ability, apart from God, to respond to the gospel. I Listen to me. I believe that man must, in his free will, repent and believe. But I believe that no man can unless God draws him. And, and, and you know what? You might say, okay, John, you're sounding like a Calvinist and an Arminian. I'm not trying to cause a debate here, brothers and sisters. As Charles Spurgeon said, there are, there are two rivers of salvation, God's sovereignty and man's free will and responsibility. And where they meet in the ocean of salvation, I don't quite know. But I'm going to preach them both, right? And if we're going to go out there and think that you know, God has done everything he can and now man just has to respond and now what we do, we change the method, we change the message. In our fallen humanness, in our logic, wanting people to just make some sort of decision. We dim the lights, we light some candles, we get a pastor up there that is eloquent at tugging at people's emotional strings and he gets them to walk an aisle. Problem is, Statistics say that 98% of those people that do are not converted, and yet they think they are. Shame on us for that. Shame on us. Am I giving you guys anything to wrestle with? <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, I'll, I'm going to move on. Brothers and sisters, just remember this. Men by nature do not have a little spark of divinity. They are dead in their sin and their transgression. They hate God as I did, and their lifestyles testify to the fact that they hate God. That's why. It's not that they can't believe, it's that they won't believe. And that's why they're responsible to Almighty God. Okay? And in John 3, 19, Jesus said it. Well, let's just go there. I'll whip through these scriptures. Um, you guys doing okay? I know this is the last session, and you're like, whoo, man, I thought you'd give me some little cute sermonette. But no, I, <laughs> I, uh, I hope you're being blessed. Anyway, uh, John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, meaning Christ, and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. You can write that down. I won't um, go there for the sake of, uh, of time, but it talks about that man in his fallenness, is ignorant of the things of God. He's blind to the things of God. He has been given himself over to the lewdness of his flesh to do all kinds of uncleanly things. And so, brothers and sisters, what we must realize is that we cannot rely on man's methods of evangelism to bring people to Christ. We are called to be faithful in the mission, which includes the method 
and the message. We are to be faithful with the message and trust in Almighty God to bring results. That, don't mean, that doesn't mean we do not invite people to Christ, that we don't call them to repent and believe the gospel. We do. But we should not practice these unbiblical means to get decisions for Christ. We're called to make disciples of Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians is a great example. Paul said, you know what? I came in there. Guys, listen, they, they didn't hear anything about Jesus. This was a pagan country. All right, in our pagan area. Paul goes into 1 Thessalonians and he said this to the believers after they had come to Christ. He said, Our word did not come to you in empty or in vain, but in the power and much assurance. And it says that you turned from your idols to God to serve the living God. Man's methods are God's power to turn a complete pagan that had never heard the gospel, hears the gospel and turns them to salvation, to the understanding of Christ crucified. I'll, I'll take the power of God. Let me, let me just kind of sum up what I said. I want to read, uh, th this is a great book, The Gospel's Power and Message by Paul Washer. This is not an easy read. This is a great resource, a secondary read. You can go back to it time and time again, but there is depth in this, and that's what we need in our day. I just want to read uh, some excerpts from his um, book. He said this, when we become acutely aware that the methodologies and marketing strategies and the props and gimmicks on display in much of the contemporary evangelicalism are useless and vain. If men are going to be saved, they will be saved by the supernatural power of God manifest in the preaching of the gospel. And then he goes on to say this about the gospel. For it to have a great effect upon men, it only needs to be proclaimed. It does not require a revision to make it relevant, an adaptation to make it understood, or a defense to validate it. If we stand up and proclaim it, it will do the work itself. That's pretty good. He goes on to say this, As our world becomes increasingly irreligious and anti-Christian, evangelicalism runs around aimlessly looking for a remedy. We carefully study the fads and the fashions of the culture and then make the necessary changes in the gospel in order to keep it relevant. When our culture no longer desires what we have, then we give them what they want. When a certain model of ministry draws a crowd of carnal men, we write a how-to book that lays out a strategy for the rest to follow. However, in all of this, we fail to see that we're not making the gospel relevant. We are only catering to a godless culture in order to keep it within our walls. He's talking that about the church. I think that sums it up very good. Um, Roger talked a lot about the emergent church and Brian McLaren. Let me just give you, a, 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 this is a paraphrase of a quote, but he, he basically said this, we haven't got the, the gospel right yet. Oh, really? Is that pathetic? And then he said the worst advertising for Christianity is hell and Christ crucified. That is so, so blasphemous. But that's what we're up against in this day and age. All right, let me go on. Let me go on. Please bear with me. I've got just a couple more points. Um, the next one is, okay, we've gone out. We've got the mission. We've got the method and the message. What do we do when they come to Christ? We baptize them. This is a public identification with Jesus Christ and with his church. That's exactly what Matthew 28 says. He said to go into all the world, right? And then we, we filled in with Mark and Luke, seeing that we're to proclaim the gospel message. When men and women and children come to Jesus Christ, we are to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, once again, church, is this just a suggestion or a command to be obeyed? I used to think I was being charitable uh, with people that differed in baptism, um, but it came back to, uh, to bite me a little bit. We, I recall a person in our former fellowship wouldn't get baptized, and um, he, what he wanted basically was us to just, you know, go along with him. In other words, ultimately, we were the ones called the legalist and being a little bit too dogmatic, when in reality, he wanted us to go against Scripture and not baptize for whatever belief he had. And he was the divisive one, you know. And that's a sad thing that happens. When people call us to go against the Word of God, we must say no. Does baptism save? Absolutely not. Is it an act of obedience? Absolutely. This is not a suggestion. The pattern is found in the book of Acts. Brothers and sisters, read the book of Acts if you don't believe me. 
But after coming to faith in Jesus Christ, the believer is to be willing to be publicly identified with Christ and the local body of believers in which he commits to through baptism. If he is not, I don't believe he should be received in the fellowship. I had uh, some friends visit me and uh, this last week or two, and he's a missionary, and, and uh, they have a national partner of a pastor in Bangladesh, and we were talking about this idea of baptism. You see, over there, it means something. Because they know, and this is what a brother said to me in the, about uh, Nepal, when they call those people to make a public identification with Jesus Christ, they know that they stand, because they have, many of them, lose lands, lose families, lose businesses, uh, be, be persecuted. And they said, John, when they show up and they're willing to publicly identify with Christ through the waters of baptism, we know they're converted. And you know what James said? Brother James from Bangladesh, a Muslim country, I've been there once. You know what he said? He said, we will not receive them in the fellowship if they will not publicly identify with Jesus Christ through the waters of baptism. See, it means something there. And we are called to do that. That is a public identification with Jesus Christ. And that leads me to a point of distinction. And the question is, why do we make concessions to the clear commands of Scripture? Is it because we don't want to offend anyone, and therefore we redefine who the church is? What is required? And obedience to God becomes optional. Everyone doing according to the dictates of his own heart. Let me just give you a glaring example. Brian Houston of Hillsong. Okay, they... Uh, in New York, and he's, of course, uh, overseas, but in New York, I think his brother is the pastor or was, but anyway, they had the choir member, volunteer choir member, was homosexual. And uh, he was uh, with a, a, another homosexual in their band or in their worship team or in their choir, and, well, they got engaged, okay? Now, at that point, they were not removed from the church. They were not called to repent of their sin or anything. And it took, from my understanding, if I read that right, Brian Houston eight months to make a statement. And then he made a statement, and he said, you know what? Um, we uh, welcome them into our fellowship. They can be part of our worship. They can be church members. They just cannot be in leadership. Okay, now I'm not picking out on homosexuals, okay? If somebody were shacking up with another person living in sin, uh, again, the same thing is required. My point is simply this. Brian Houston very subtly with the influence that he has, redefined who is the church. And that's exactly what the seeker-sensitive movement does. They redefine who is the church. The church is who? The called out ones. We don't go to church. We are the church. We're the people of God, born again of His Spirit. And we're the only ones that are the church. There, God always meant for us to be distinct and that is a blasphemous, glaring example of somebody that wants to redefine the church to pat his own back pocket, in my opinion. The church is the called out ones. Those who truly belong to Christ. So then the question is, should there be a biblical process to make this distinction? I think Acts is very clear. Repent and believe. And if you have repented and believed, you ought to be able to give testimony of trusting in Jesus Christ, right? Right? You ought to be able to give a gospel presentation, not that you have to be a, 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 you know, one of, a, a leading scholar on it, but because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. It's like Roger read today. Before we had the Holy Spirit, before we converted, we were what? We didn't have the Holy Spirit. We, the, the Word of God made no sense. The gospel was foolish. We were apathetic or antagonistic. Then all of a sudden, we're born again. You know, the Spirit draws. We repent and believe. We're born again. And guess what? We understand the gospel. We ought to be able to share what the gospel is. We ought to be able to give a testimony. And upon that testimony, we ought to be willing to be baptized, which says, you know what? I am identifying publicly with Jesus Christ, and I am committing to a local fellowship. And I'm going to be devoted to that local fellowship. That is the call of every single person that has come to Christ. So yes, I believe there is a biblical process for that. Now many would say, John, this is legalism. You're being harsh. Uh, we don't need to make such a distinction. 1 Corinthians 5, sexually immoral man. What did Paul say? Put him out. Well, brothers and sisters, here's a question for you. How do you put somebody out unless you've received them in? How about Acts 5? 
God strikes down Ananias and Sapphira. It says those outsiders feared the church and they would not join them. You know where we, that word join means? Glue. It has the idea of they would not commit to Christ and to that local body of fellowship. Isn't that interesting? And so we got this idea that we don't want to make a distinction in the church today because we don't want to offend anyone. That, that, that's a sad thing because we look at church as kind of this building by which we market for the purpose of getting people to come and like us and therefore like our Jesus. And we'll do anything to keep them coming, including failure to make a distinction between the saved and the lost, failure to obey God's word, and failure to practice church discipline. How many people here, I'm just, I'm just interested, I take it you've been in churches, and some of you probably longer than others, have you ever seen church discipline practice in your church? Raise your hands. Okay? One, two, three, a few. That's good. That's good because it, 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 there's a part of that. And it's always not just to kick somebody out. It, the, the heart is of God, and it should be of those leaders in the church, is to bring about repentance and restoration. Amen? That's God's heart, Okay? So I'm not trying to sound harsh here, but, but many people look at church discipline. That's harsh. We, we probably better not do that. So the church just carries on in carnality and, and you have unbelievers and believers and so forth. You know, there's only one place in Scripture where it says that perhaps an unbeliever came into the believing church. That is in 1 Corinthians. And that wasn't Paul's main point. In other words, Paul wasn't talking about having unbelievers come in with you. He was rebuking them for the misuse of their gifts. You guys remember that? But he said, if an unbeliever comes in. If an unbeliever comes into our fellowship, we should welcome them. We should love them. But we don't cater to them as far as changing the message, right? right. You can't find another place in Scripture where it says... That the church is just this conglomerate mixture of saved and lost people and we sing kumbaya on Sunday and then just go our own way. You can't, you can't find it. And unfortunately, we've gotten away from that. And as Paul Washer says, the church of America looks more like a six flags over Jesus instead of a devoted group of followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to be. Why? Because brothers and sisters... In these churches today, it's not about discipleship, but about numbers. It's about appearing successful in the eyes of the world. We want the world's applause, just like Israel of old wanted to be liked by the world and instead of wanting to please the Lord. And we can't do that. Last point, I'm done. I'm going to fly through it. I'm just going to give you some scriptures. The last point of this, and many people leave this out, and that is verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now look at that. There is an authority in the church. The authority is Jesus Christ, right? We've been born of His Spirit. And so now what is Jesus saying to be the authoritative means by which we call people to observe all things? This, the Word of God. Amen? This is simple, isn't it? This really is simple, making disciples. If we just follow the plan. Let, let me just fly through some scriptures with you. And I'm not trying to be harsh or facetious or kind of sarcastic. Um, I, I, I love the church of Jesus Christ. It burdens me when I see this happening and, 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 and what they're doing to God's word and, and the gospel. But Jesus in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. How are we sanctified? By hearing the word of God, being renewed in the spirit of our mind, and then submitting and obeying, right? Pretty simple. That's what God says. Ephesians 4. Go there with me. This is key, brothers and sisters, because this is what we've been hearing all weekend, and, and this is what we're seeing. Some believers have been deceived by false teaching, and it's our job to warn them in love and to show them the truth so hopefully they won't go down a wrong path. God has taught me a lot through the school of hard knocks. Guys, I, listen. I have been at the extreme side of Pentecostalism. I've been at the extreme side of a Reformed Baptist. I've been an Arminian. I've been a Calvinist. I've, been, I've run the whole gamut. And God has continually renewed my mind and brought me back to the truth. And I haven't arrived, but I, I think I'm further along than I was 10 years ago. I praise God for it because, man, I, he took me through some rough roads there. That, that woodshed is a little... It's not fun sometimes, is it? Anyway, all right, Ephesians 4, 11. Look what he says. Here's the purpose. Here's God's heart. He loves his bride. 
And he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now look at church. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, building up of the body of Christ, till we all come, look at it, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, that means mature, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the coveting craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love may grow up. I would rather have 20 people in a fellowship that are growing up than 500 people acting carnal and calling it church. Growing up in Christ, that's the measure of growth. Who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's a wonderful scripture. You can preach on that till Jesus comes back if he tarries much longer, and I'm hoping he doesn't. 1 Timothy 4. Again, I want to rattle these off. Um, I don't even know how long it is. What time is it? How long have I gone? You guys aren't even keeping time. You're so intent, and, right? Okay. 1 Timothy 4. I know you guys have been through, through quite a weekend. 1 Timothy 4, 17 to 18. 1 Timothy 4. Maybe that's 2 Timothy 4. Maybe it's not even 2 Timothy 4. Okay, forget that one. I got it wrong. Two t go. <laughs> I was writing this down this morning and my eyes were a little bit uh, bug-eyed. Um, anyway, what I wanted to say is this, that Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy or uh, 2 Timothy 1, verse 13, forgive me. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. He goes on to tell Timothy various things that he should be doing, such as this. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Look at this, brothers and sisters. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scriptures are sufficient to save somebody and to grow somebody. The scriptures are enough. And certainly there's good secondary resources. Hear me on that. But, but the scriptures are enough. You know, Timothy, or Paul, was so, um, I guess, uh, intent on this that when he was talking about honoring elders, actually it was 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. Look at the emphasis here. I'm not, I'm not trying to make a, a state for, for anything other than this. There's other things in there, but look at it. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders, and, that, and, and brothers and sisters, another thing for a healthy church is, the church is autonomous. I might get in trouble with this. I'm, I'm not a fan of denominations because I, I believe it's the, the, the reformers didn't break off the strain of the Catholic hierarchy and that has corrupted more denominations than you can shake a stick at. I believe in the autonomy of the church to run by qualified elders, men who are qualified to serve in that capacity, 1 Timothy 3. I believe that's what the Bible states. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially, look at this church, those who labor in the word and doctrine. You know what that word labor has the idea of? To a wearisome toil. To a wearisome toil. You see where God exalts the word? Not that he's exalting a man or an office. He's exalting his word above all things. And that is to have the preeminence because Christ is the preeminent one. Look at what it says. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. The labor is worthy of his wages. And then he goes on to say this. In perilous times... What are we to do? The Bible says, 2 Timothy 4, to preach the word, right? In season, obviously. The Bible says the time will come when they'll store up what? Teachers that will give their itching ears what they want to hear, right? And what are we called to do? Preach the word. Let the light shine in the darkness. That's what we're called to do. Preach and proclaim the word. We are to be steadfast in the apostles' teaching. And again, I just wanted to bring all this out to say that I honestly believe that much of the church growth is, is blasphemy, it's hearsay. It's not of God. When you compare it to the Great Commission, the model of church growth, 
Growth modeled after the purpose-driven life relies heavily on music that mimics the world, storytellers that give us cute sermonettes and leave us starving, an all-inclusive club, no distinction, no discipline, programs that appeal to felt needs. And in the end, I believe the church has been no better off, but far worse. So what do you do if you're in a church like this? Leave. I would just tell you to leave. Biblical separation and obedience to the Word of God goes beyond and above any family ties, any church ties, anything. You leave. Um, because I believe that the seeker-sensitive church, for the most part, I'm not saying there's not true believers in there. Hear me on this. I believe it's apostate. It no longer adheres to the Word of God. They're drinking from a man-made well. They are polluting themselves with the arm of the flesh. Remember in Jeremiah 2.13? My last scripture, by the way. Jeremiah 2.13. Israel did the same thing. Look what he said here. God said this. Jeremiah 2.13. He said this, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Brothers and sisters, we have had this conference to earnestly to, to understand what it is in this day and age. We've been informed about what is going on now. You and I are called to earnestly contend for the faith. If you have people that have fallen into this in love, present to them resources. Pray that God would bring them out of it. Do it in the right spirit, in the right manner, right? We're called to do that. We're called to be gentle with all people. Do that. Don't let them stay in it. But if they must stay in it, pray for them. That's about all we can do at that point. It's, it's a sad, sad thing. Um, but we're called to do that. We're called to earnestly contend. That means to stand up against error and to stand for the truth. You will not be popular, and I'm talking within the church, and you can probably talk to Roger more about that. Um, I'm sure he could tell you stories, and Warren and others, and Gary. You're not going to be popular. This is not a popularity contest. It's about truth. It's about love for our Savior. Jesus said, this is he who loves me, who obeys my commands. Stand up for the truth. Help others see the truth, and then earnestly, just as earnestly as we contend for the faith, earnestly proclaim for it. And the last promise that Jesus gave us in there, I'm not going to go into it, but hopefully this will bless you. He said this, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. Our Lord is with us. He is building his church. There is a true and faithful remnant. And you know what? We can make a difference in these dark days. We just have to stick to the blueprint. Let's close in prayer. Father, I just thank you uh, for this opportunity to um, share the good news, to exhort the brethren. Father, we do live in dark days, but we don't have to be discouraged. Um, it is a burden, just like it was for your prophets of old. They ached when Israel went astray, and they called them back to repentance. And the incredible thing about you, Lord, is your mercy, your grace, that no matter if we stumble into that, you, you call us out. You love us. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And you teach us. So, Father, what we need to do is be humble, teachable, draw near to you, and you'll draw near to us. Help us to stick to the word. Help us to rightly divide it, Lord, and to edify the body of Christ in these days. And, Father, may you just continue to increase it as far as bringing people into the church through faith and repentance in Christ and also building up your church through your word, that we would be that bright and shining true remnant ready for the bride, ready for the bridegroom when he comes to get us. And we know it's soon, so even so, come Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks. God bless you so much. We appreciate you coming this weekend.